Hayret ses. Arpa İnstitüti Gome, Pari Karus Polorit, Yev Şunagavicum Vurg Masnaktik Mer Kınarmana. Ays Kınargumu Bidinenk Antverenov, Masnaket Nere Vurde Vantveren Avedila Verdahilvin. So we are going to talk about uh, today the challenges facing Armenia. And uh, as you can um, see, the moderator will be Dr. Raif Kabayan, and he will be coordinating the panel discussion, and he will intro introduce all the panelists. But before we go to the uh, discussion, I'd like to say a few words about ARPA Institute and its activities in Armenia. Uh, as many of you know, we have been working in Armenia for the last 36 years, uh, trying to advance science, technology, healthcare, education, and so on. And uh, all our members are experts in various fields. And we try to uh, uh, help the institutes, the universities, and also work with the government so that we can, we can achieve as much as possible. And so if, if you like what ARPA Institute is doing, please um, donate so we can do more in Armenia. We have several ongoing projects right now. Uh, one of them, uh, two of them actually are in the Alekhanyan National Lab, uh, and then one in the Polytechnic University, and also with the uh, Yerevan State University. So, the, in the Arakhanian uh, National Lab, we have uh, uh, started in two new programs. Uh, one of them is an experimental research, and uh, it is related to uh, solar cells, silicon solar cells, and with a new approach, which is being directed by Professor Arab Karyan in UC Irvine, we are going to, um, uh, the research shows actually that the efficiency of the solar cells um, can increase up to 50%, which is more than doubling it with compared to the current uh, market efficiencies. So this could be very important for Armenia, especially if we can manufacture it in Armenia and uh, it will be competitive with, uh, with petroleum. And also there's the uh, research part of it, which is being done in the Yerevan State University. And the research also uh, proves the experimental results. And so they are both very promising. We also have in the Alekhanya National Lab, a detection lab where they are trying to develop new detectors um, and we're trying to help this group. Also, we have a, another project which is called um, photomultiplier tube, radio frequency photomultiplier tube, which is essentially a single photon detector, which is very important in many, many areas, in medical fields, in, in high technology areas, for microscopes and so on. And we are helping that um, also to be developed. We're actually trying to build now a prototype. Um, and also we are starting a new center of excellence for circuit design in the Polytechnic University, which will essentially provide a new course or probably courses related to an internationally known software for circuit design which is the Cadence software. So now without further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, panel director, Dr. Kabayan. He's a vis visiting scientist at the Lawrence Livermore lab. And also he works at the Pentagon uh, in the joint chief of staff and as a researcher. So Harair, the floor is yours. Well, well uh, Hagop, thank you very much for the introduction. I appreciate it, and I appreciate uh, all the briefers, of course. 
and all the participants. I see we have a good number of participants who are uh, going to be participating. It's going to be recorded, so you may be able to send it to your friends. Uh, before I start uh, into the program, I would like to give the uh, yield the floor to Yer uh, Dr. Yervan Zorian. Uh, he was instrumental in getting the first phase of this a year ago going at, um, at uh, on the AV uh, Armenian Virtual College platform, and and uh, so. Uh, Yervan, over to you if you want to make some uh, uh, introductory remarks. It would be appreciated. Uh, please, sure. I can do that. Thank you. Um, so last year we were able to uh, to start this process, again, with, with uh, close collaboration with, uh, with Raid Kabayan. In this case, he did uh, introduce us to the concept of uh, scenario-based planning. And after the war, we felt that uh, strategic planning based on scenarios was essential. That's why we uh, intended to create a course via ABC, via the HBU Armenian Virtual College, which teaches uh, strategic planning via scenarios. And we did the phase one, as uh, Rara just mentioned, uh, of the panel discussion like this, which got recorded. But the theory side of it is also part of the same course. So there's a theory part taught by Alison Courtois, and then the, the, the practice part, the panel that we had last year, two-day panel, and that all is um, uh, offered by ABC on a quarterly basis. We had several cohorts already. Currently, we have a cohort from the government. Uh, multiple ministries and the prime ministry employees are taking the course at this point as, as one of the cohorts. Uh, this is just to let you know that this course continues to be offered on a quarterly basis. And the scenarios that are being looked at are similar to the ones that you will see here today. So this new one will be will be essential um, to be added. So it will be augmented to the course as well, uh, in addition to the white paper that uh, Dr. Kabayan uh, will talk about as well. Okay, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Yervant. I also want to recognize Arpine Tavakalyan. Arpine is participating today. She was instrumental in getting everything going for us last year and through, throughout the year. As I always say, and I'm sure she's bored getting me say that, uh, she walks on water. So Arpine, I'm so happy you're participating and look forward to collaborating with you more. Okay, so let's go with, with our program. Uh, let me be upfront with you. I am not going to take your time introducing the our phenomenal uh, participants today. Uh, that will take too much time. We have a big program. You can see their bios uh, in the booklet that Hagop has forwarded, uh, extensive bios and the, all their articles. Uh, so, so I hope you don't mind. I am not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. But again, I wanna still thank all the participants. I think I'm watching here. I think we got, uh, uh, almost uh, 30, 40, 40 people participating. So that's very good. It's going to get recorded so you can take it, send it to your friends who were not able to participate. Uh, now, very briefly, I, I would like to mention that the follow-on to this, these are talks on ge geopolitical uh, uh, challenges and opportunities uh, Armenia is facing. Uh, the next one in May, uh, I want to... Uh, say, uh, mentioned that Dr. Na uh, Naira Sakyan from AUA uh, is gonna, has put together the report already. It's, uh, the title is Asio Political Assessment of Presidents Erdogan and Aliyev. Um, so that's gonna happen in May. So stay tuned. Uh, uh, the ARPA Institute will be, uh, will be uh, scheduling that, that talk in, in May. All right. So, Again, I wanna thank all of our panelists and all the par participants. So let me, the way we're gonna do this, uh, like I said, I'm not gonna read the bios. It's gonna take too much time. Uh, each each participant will have 10 minutes and I'm gonna open it up to each participant with specific questions based on the articles they presented. And I'm gonna go in the alphabetical order. So I'm gonna, uh, if, if, if that's okay, I'm gonna get going here. So our first speaker, is gonna be Dr. David Agopian. And David, so let me pose the questions to you that came up very distinctly in the article you presented. So you you you made, I extracted, you know, so it's subjective. <laughs> I did the extraction. Uh, three themes that I thought were very important for people to focus on. 
So here they are under the leadership of President Erdogan. And, and you're going to, oh, by the way, Tabit is going to be uh, assessing Armenia-Turkey relationship. So Turkey's role in all this. So under the leadership of President Erdogan, the country has shifted its focus towards a more assertive role on its immediate neighborhood and harbors ambitions for regional dominance. Point one. Point two, there are potential fault lines in Turkey's uh, relations with Azerbaijan. That's point two. And the third point you made that I extracted from your article, which I thought was very relevant, Armenia's diplomacy with respect to Turkey must be creative and think outside the box. David, over to you, 10 minutes to address these three issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hrdar. Good morning to you and good evening to the colleagues on this side of the globe. Uh, we'll try to be brief. The time is limited, so 10 minutes. We'll try to respect the limits given. Uh, first, I cannot say that I'm a political analyst and dealt with the Turkey, but I, I, was more, I was more a professional. I spent 20 something years with the United Nations. I worked in the countries from Central Asian stands, Afghanistan, up to Middle East and East and North Africa. So, and Turkey here and there, I always had the interactions. So, uh, and have always very special interest how the Turks are thinking, what they are aiming for, and where they want to go. So a couple of words maybe about this summary on my perception or my assessment of what the Turkey is, and then we'll go specific to your questions. I think first it is, we all know, Turkey has this uh, glorious times in the 16th century. It was probably the superpower of the world. And it has similar to Russia, but Russia has much more recently this experience of being the superpower. They still have these nostalgic feelings about dominating the world. And also they have the special responsibility being the religious. I mean, Sultan of Ottoman Empire was the leader of the Sunni Islam, at least. And, but at the same time, Turkey is the first democratic Islamic republic with Kemal Atatürk completely changing the Turkey and building the new statehood out of the Ottoman Empire. So, and then geographic location of Turkey being, they said, the bridge between the Europe and Asia and also closely connected to Africa also. And I, I, I, when I was in Somalia, in fact, Erdogan was the only head of the state who visited two times in four years Somalia. And he visited almost all African countries also. And this is, I'm coming to this point that Erdogan, and especially with Erdogan, it became new type of expansionist Turkish approach to the neighbors. I mean, first it was very peaceful and probably I can divide the Erdogan rule of 21 years by two decades. First decade, he was showing his interest in the region, in the neighborhood, but it was more to about zero problem with all the neighbors. So including our soccer diplomacy, including many other efforts with most of the neighbors in the region. And interesting enough, at the same time, Turkey first beginning of the millennium, my former boss, UNDP administrator Kemal Dervish, who was before the Minister of Finance, designed economic reforms, which led to economic like accelerated growth of the first decade in the 21st century. Then we got another Erdogan after he got elected probably as a president who became much more aggressive in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, and supporting Azerbaijan also, and trying to impose who, I mean, his dominance in the region. Today, there was a very interesting article in Economist about Indian Prime Minister Moody, and he, he made, they, they were asking, whether Muzi is Erdogan or Muzi is Lee Kuan Yew, the Singapore's prime minister. And the point was there that whether this, uh, I mean, whether they can temper, whether he can, Muzi can temper his authoritarian instincts within some limits. Assuming that Erdogan has this problem, limiting his authoritarian instincts and trying to dominate. My own assessment, Erdogan is very aggressive and try to dominate where possible. 
but at the same time, he's also uh, trying to, uh, he understands his limits and he can go up to some limit. The way it happened with Russia in 2015, and now also, I mean, despite all the sort of ups and downs, I understood the latest he's going on May 9 to Washington to have an official meeting with Biden, I think first in many years. Uh, I mean, with Trump, he had few meetings. And so he's accepting the Western alliance, he's mostly part of, but he's trying to play his role also with the rest of the world. So when we speak about Turkey and the region, I think it is important to factor many, I mean, implications for Armenia. Huh? So Turkey and Russia, and we have been sandwiched in between Turkey and Russia for at least 200 or more years. And this is again, the time where we need to make some difficult decisions. Turkey and Middle East, when I was in Syria and I was a witness firsthand, I mean, how aggressive Turkey could be and how much they, let's say, they, they, they took some parts of uh, control over the Syrian territories, then after Iraq, etc. So Turkey and Middle East, former colonies of uh, Ottoman Empire, they still consider they can have a say there. So this is, uh, but also Turkey is a part of NATO and probably the, sp the spoiled child of NATO. I mean, Turkey feels, uh, I mean, I guess this is the only Islamic country, Islamic country in, or maybe I'm wrong, sorry. Uh, but uh, so Turkey Albania. is, uh, Albania, Albania also, yes, thank you. So although Albania is not 100%, it's 80 to 20, I think, but whatever. So, but at the same time, I think, so Turkey is allowed to be much more different than most of the other alliance members, but then there are still some limits and uh, then Turkey so far, I think they are respecting. When I was reflecting on our discussion a year and a few months ago, the first discussion, and I was also speaking then about Turkey, I think one of the things which I made the point that Turkey gravitates toward Russia, toward Iran, Azerbaijan, all these autocratic neighbors of Armenia. But then to me, this gravitation has certain limits and Turkish democratic, the basics of the states, it has some foundations and it will not turn into totally the authoritarian regime. And the last recent few months ago, a few weeks ago election, the local election showed also that the, the democracy has deep roots in Turkey within some limits also. And Turkey still to me, with all these like back and forth playing and flirting with Russia and the rest of the authoritarian regimes, I think it more belongs to the Western alliance and NATO alliance. Now coming to Azerbaijan and uh, Turkey, to one nation, two states, the way they have declared it on many occasions, I think, but there are still definitely many dividing lines, and I call them fault lines. Natural, naturally, Sunni versus Shia, and Shia gravitate to Iran. Of course, Azerbaijan is not deeply religious, but still there is an element of this. Azeri military is constructed from two, uh, the, the, the, two, two parts, the Russian trained, Russian sort of systems organization, and Turkey, NATO, whatever. So and there is a natural to me conflict between these two type of construct of the army. And we need to think, I mean, uh, whether they will come into conflict or not, but there are issues which we can try to explore. Um, I think also Russian dominance is much more corrupting dominance and the traditions coming from Russia are much more corrupt than the traditions coming from Turkey and especially. And then naturally, I mean, the last, of course, Israel-related issues. Turkey took a very strong stand against Israel and pro-Hamas, uh, pro-Gaza, uh, and also pro-Hamas. I mean, Erdogan received recently, last couple of days ago, Hamas leadership also in Ankara. So while Azerbaijan is quite careful, silent, and try still maintaining good relations with Israel and on Gaza, the statements are very sort of, I mean, they didn't make any strong statement. And overall, of course, this democracy versus autocracy. So with all the sort of limitations of Turkish democracy, 
it still has an issue, uh, has a foundation there, which Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan is more type of Central Asian family, uh, family or, um, autocracy or totalitarian regime. Well, probably outside the family, it's very hard to imagine how the power will be transformed, transferred. Uh, well, uh, the Turkey is totally different. Uh, I remember myself when I was in Central Asia some 20 years ago, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, the first wave of Turkish investment, businesses, etc. When they came, they were quite welcome. But after a few years, I mean, there was some resistance against the Turkey. They are different, culturally different. And then it was not that obvious that to be great to run has sort of attraction on all sides of the Turkish world. Now they come back probably a couple of words about Armenian-Turkey relations. And then I mentioned the part related to Armenia trying to play smart with uh, Turkey, or, I mean, Turkey versus Russia, Turkey versus Azerbaijan, but also, let's say, uh, to, we definitely need to partition our discussions with Turkey and our discussions with Azerbaijan and not, not uh, make, make the best possible not to mix the two, the two lines of discussion uh, into one. Second, to me, he, Turkey is a EU candidate. Of course, it is already 25 years the candidate, probably the longest uh, in, in the queue waiting. But at the same time, uh, I mean, I don't know how much and how quickly the Georgia will move with the EU accession process, but if Georgia face some problem, at least I think uh, Turkey offers possibly another opportunity for Armenia as a transport connection to Europe, but also as a political probably some connection, which we need. I, of course, I understand the challenges there, but at least we need to try to explore it a bit deeper and more. Trade and complementarity of our economies. So of course, our trade relations are very minimal. And I know the sentiment in Armenia that in Turkey, and I've been many times, they don't have that much deep sentiments about Armenian goods, and they are very limited number of Armenian goods. But complementarity and our view is diversification of our economic relations, which is more about shifting our export to Russia, to all countries, including Europe, Middle East, and possibly also to Turkey, is part of our effort also. And eventually, if we can build economic win-wins, it will be something with, to help us and to help them also. But of course, this all need to be done with major precaution about, let's say, the complicated history we have with them, and we have to do it very carefully and factoring also the, the, the successes we have with Azerbaijan and ongoing, let's say, process, which is very challenging. So I will stop here. Thank you. Well, Tavi, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very much appreciated. Uh, I see we have about 45 people participating so far. That's a great, uh, that's a great number. It's going to be recorded. Please, please, to all the participants, uh, please post your questions in the in the, the in the, uh, that you have, and we're gonna get to as many of them at the end. So please start posting your your, your question. So the next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Anna Markian. Uh, you probably remember Anna; she participated last year, but last year she was representing Iran. So, uh, but today she's looking at Iran Armenia. Uh, complex Iran-Armenia relationship. And Anna, I have, based on your article, again, I encourage you guys, all the participants, to go back and read those wonderful reports our wonderful participants have uh, provided. So I have three. I have the following questions for you, Anna, based on your, on your article. The balancing approach towards regional countries remains the main feature of Iran's policy in the South Caucasus. So that's one point you make. The second point you make, there's a complex interplay of regional dynamics and Iran's red lines and positions in the so-called corridor issue, which is a very important issue. That's the second point you make that I extracted from your article. And the third point you make, which I thought was uh, very interesting, worth uh, talking about, 
Iranian officials declared their unequivocal support of Armenia's territorial integrity and full support of the crossroad of peace announced by the Prime Minister of Armenia. Uh, Anna, over to you to address these issues. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks uh, for the opportunity, both in participating in writing the white paper and also in this very important discussion. Uh, so I, I wanted to mention uh, two things uh, to show that talking about Iran's policy in our region is uh, uh, very important, not only from the point of view of security issues of our country, but also taking into account that uh, last surveys take, um, taken by uh, International Republican Institute show that for Armenian public also, Iran is one of the three countries of the most important security and also political partner. So uh, taking this into account, we internally in Armenia now have discussions and discourses on Armenia-Iran relations that frequently are offered on uh, very extremist ideas from the one point take, uh, talking that uh, Armenia EU and Armenia the West relations are against Armenia Iran relations and vice versa that Iran uh, collaborates with the West uh, to help uh, Armenia and so in my paper um, I try to explore the multifaceted landscape of Iran's regional policy amidst the backdrop of global turbulence and try to refer to to the complexities of Iran's strategic calculations, focusing on its relationship, not only with the countries in the region, but also beyond. And um, we, uh, we live in a situation and in times when every day uh, important features and developments happen and uh, Iran's attack on Israel and after that also Iran, Israel's claims that Israel also had its response uh, where after uh, we had already written our white papers but these developments also of course have its influence and I will uh, uh, refer to those how these developments can weaken Iran's position in, in the region but in the report uh, I stress the importance not to forget Iran-Russia relations when talking about Iran's policy in the region and uh, because this uh, relationship uh, is in the heart of Iran's regional strategy and because Russia is a key player in shaping geopolitical dynamics, uh, Iran has strategically aligned itself with Moscow uh, even after Ukrainian war started, perceiving an opportunity to capitalize on what it views as an emerging international order. Despite officially denying direct military support, evidence suggests a significant level of cooperation between Iran and uh, Russia, including the inspection of drones and missile defense systems. With all this military support, however, Iran is not openly supporting Russia as it will be the country that was a subject of aggression itself during Iran-Iraq war and now supporting in other <clears throat> Another obstacle to the open support of Russia is Iran's security concerns concerning some neighbors' territorial demands towards Iran, and especially you know about Azerbaijan's strategies towards uh, some territories of Iran, uh, taking into consideration the ethnic minorities living in the areas that are subject to those demands. It will be a risky step for Iran to press Russian policies towards its neighbor and annexation of its territories. The cooperation of the countries, though, is reflected in the economic indicators. By January 2023 already, Russia had become the largest foreign investor uh, in Iran, and uh, uh, it put it $2.7 billion into Iranian manufacturing, mining, and transport sectors. 
Um, and uh, it's important to mention that also the issue of Russia-Iran relations is at the center of the attention of Western analysts, especially in the conditions of the current global confrontation. The factor of Azerbaijan in uh, an intermediate link in these relations seems to be often ignored. Uh, and um, interestingly, these uh, part of their relations are sometimes also ignored uh, when looking from Yerevan also, uh, forgetting about this very important economic cooperation between Azerbaijan, Iran, Azerbaijan and Russia. Uh, and Azerbaijan, for its part, uses its anti-Iranian and sometimes anti-Russian rhetoric to present itself as a uh, as a part of the collective West. Also, we, of course, um, see some tensions between uh, uh, the West and Azerbaijan, this PASA issue and discussions uh, about sanctions and other stuff. But whenever it comes to the issues of uh, Ukrainian war or uh, Israel's uh, politics and also war in Gaza, Azerbaijan tries to present itself as a part of this collective West. At the same time, however, Azerbaijan is deepening its economic cooperation with Iran and Russia, and these countries consider Azerbaijan as an important partner in the energy sector with the increasing role of a bridge between them. Uh, and also uh, not only in energy sector, but also in the field of in infrastructure and important connectivity links. Several days ago, for example, when Ali was in Moscow, one of the top topics uh, was, uh, of course, this infrastructure issue. And in, in this regard, Iran's attitude also is very important. Um, and uh, when it comes to Iran's role in um, uh, supporting Armenia's uh, security uh, issues and also Iran's red lines towards uh, Ar Ar Armenia's territorial integrity, it's uh, important to mention that uh, the main topic uh, which is uh, also considered an important red line for Iran is the so-called corridor issue, uh, Zangezur corridor that Azerbaijan and Turkish side uh, demand from Armenia. Uh, Iran's commitment to Armenia's territorial integrity and its cooperation with France, uh, I mean, Armenia-France uh, cooperation, and also Iran's stance that uh, Tehran, official Tehran, not only isn't against of this cooperation, but sometimes they uh, also have some um, uh, areas of cooperation themselves when it comes to uh, Armenia's security. Uh, this uh, shows Iran's proactive uh, uh, regional policy and their, Tehran's desire to be more active uh, in the region. Uh, and I want also to highlight several factors why this corridor issue is um, very important for Iran to oppose. And first of all, this is uh, not only Armenia's territorial integrity, but territorial, the concept of territorial integrity itself. Iran, like many nations, prioritizes, prioritizes the principle of territorial integrity and establishment of the Zangezur Corridor, uh, which will uh, connect Azerbaijan with its exclave Nahejevan via extraterritoriality, raises concerns about potential territorial concessions and border changes. Uh, Geopolitical dynamics also uh, can be influenced, of course, uh, and uh, security concerns in other factor. Iran is very uh, uh, worried of the security implications associated with the corridor uh, because uh, it will uh, introduce a, a potential to uh, have uh, extra regional presence uh, this time not only in Azerbaijan proper, and for Iran, it's it, it especially worrying Israel's presence, but also uh, Israel's uh, possible presence also on the corridor, uh, just on the border uh, with Iran. Uh, 
regional stability is another factor why uh, this issue is a red line for uh, Iran. And also we must not forget also about economic influence. Iran serves as an Im uh, important economic partner for Azerbaijan, as I said. Uh, and uh, having this uh, economic leverage um, is very important taking it to, into account that nowadays Azerbaijan connects with its exclave via Iran. And so this gives also uh, important tools to Iran to have uh, economic and political leverage on Azerbaijan. For example, uh, if we consider the discussions uh, of um, possible uh, military attack of Israel on Iran, uh, taking uh, the discussions taking place nowadays, uh, both uh, in Iran and beyond the country, uh, several scenarios are considered, and one of them is the possible involvement of Azerbaijan uh, in, in that case. And uh, for Iran, it's important to have this political and economic leverage on Azerbaijan in order to not to uh, happen this kind of scenario. Um, so, and, and also um, here it's important to mention that Azerbaijan also manipulates this issue too, uh, whenever they are uh, discussing the issue of corridor with uh, Western partners, uh, they are threatening that if uh, Armenia will not give the extraterritorial corridor, that they, they will create a corridor via Iran, um, but the manipulation here uh, lies on the different legal statuses of the transit routes going via Iran and the route Azerbaijan demands from Armenia. Uh, and also one more factor, political mobilization uh, is also a factor that influences on Iran's stance against the uh, Zangezur corridor. Uh, the Azerbaijani minority in Iran has um, sometimes have uh, and is expressing sentiments of solidarity with their uh, ethnic kin in Azerbaijan. Of course, we can uh, uh, discuss uh, how much this is influencing overall the politics of Iran, but internally they have cre they are creating some. Uh, demands also from the official Tehran. And so the perception of territorial gains uh, for Azerbaijan through the corridor could lead to political mobilization also and uh, possible advocacy among the population potentially exacerbating tensions with Iran. Um, another um, important factor in this uh, issue is also, of course, strate strategic positioning because um, growing strategic uh, position of Azerbaijan uh, in the region will increase even more uh, by having this extraterritorial corridor. And so that's why for Iran, it's also uh, perceived as a threat. Um, and so just to conclude, uh, Iran's regional policy reflects a delicate balancing act amidst the complexities of global geopolitics. And by strategically aligning with Russia uh, and engaging in the South Caucasus, Iran seeks to assert its influence and safeguard its uh, strategic uh, interests. Uh, and um, whenever uh, they speak about uh, their own red lines, sometimes in several cases, as I mentioned, especially in the case of the corridor issue, their rail red lines coincide with uh, Armenians' red lines, and that's where uh, Armenia and Iran are cooperating and must cooperate further. Thanks for your attention, and I will be happy to answer questions. Well, Anna, thank you very much. Uh, very much appreciated. I would request that if you're not talking, please mute yourself just in case, you know, you, uh, and then uh, uh, 
we have a fair good number of participants. I encourage you to keep uh, posting your questions. Tavit, you already have two questions posted uh, uh, for you here. If you could look at them and be ready at the end to address them. And Anna, I see one question already posted for, uh, for you here. So I'm going to keep track of those. Uh, so I, uh, so, so now the next, our next uh, participant is Nejde Hovserpian. Again, they're all coming in alphabetically, okay? So Nejde, I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Nejde could not participate today. He had to travel. So he recorded uh, his answers to the questions and Ahagop is going to uh, show you the recording. But here are the questions I asked Nejde uh, to address based on the article he provided. Again, I'm repeating myself. Please read those articles. Our participants spent a, a fair amount of time. We went back and forth, back and forth. They did a great editing job. So I encourage you to read them. They're five, six pages long. It shouldn't be too hard for you. Most of you are great readers. I know that. So he, here are the questions I asked Nejde to, to address. Uh, and he, he his angle was Azerbaijan. So uh, with most of its objectives achieved, Azerbaijan has the luxury of patience and can afford to wait for the right moment to sign a peace agreement when it sees maximum advantage to itself. So that's the first point Nejde made in his article. Second point, it can bide its time and only commit to a peace deal when it's most advantageous to itself. And the third point, he made, it is demonstrating aspirations of becoming a regional hegemon, and it's actively pursuing a unique form of 21st century vassal suzerain relations in the Caucasus. Move on then, and um, we'll come back to this. Uh, okay, thank you, Hago. Let, we'll come back to it. Uh, again, if we, don't, if we don't get to it, please read his article. He does a great job addressing those issues. So Alexander, we're, you're next. Um, uh, and I'm going to uh, read the questions I, I posed to you. You, you. you looked at the Russia, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Russia angle. So, uh, so here, are, here are the two questions I, I, I, I extracted from your article. Uh, Russia is arguably the most potent of all external players in the South Caucasus. Full stop. Yet it is also the only one whose pre presence and influence is decreasing. That's the first thing I extracted. The second one, it no longer has much to offer in the realm of security in the region, and it is hard to imagine the restoration of such hegemony. All right, that's the two points. So, Alexander, over to you to address those questions. Uh, thank you, all right. Uh, I will try to, to to expand it, and I I will try to do it short. Uh, first, uh, actually, yes, Russia is our uh, I would say biggest neighbor, biggest no, not direct neighbor member neighbor. We have Georgia uh, between us, but but it's a really huge neighbor by I would say all standards. Uh, it's a nuclear power, military, human, uh, economic, financial resources, resources. All this is in, in, incomparable to Armenia's uh, modest ones. Uh, Russia is bigger than Armenia uh, by territory uh, 600 times. Russia's uh, population of Russia is also large, about 50 times uh, that of Armenia. Russia is former metropolis. It was metropolis in in Russian Empire, Tsarist Empire, and it was a metropolis in time <clears throat> USSR. Armenia was part of this empire. I think... Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Art, Art Gurdikian, I appreciate if you can mute yourself, please. Sorry, go ahead, Alexander. Uh, I think that USSR was one of the forms of Russian Empire continuation, very special form, but form of Russian Empire. So Armenia was 200 years, about 200 years 
uh, a bit less uh, a member of this country. So Russia is only great power, a global power, which is close to us. Generally speaking, the structure of South Caucasus is like that. It's three countries, one triangle inside another triangle. The uh, I mean, recognized states of, uh, or widely recognized states of South Caucasus, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, and they are surrounded by three former empires, uh, Russian Federation, Turkey, and, and uh, Iran. And uh, all this, in some time of its history, a whole South Caucasus or part of South Caucasus was part of this or that empire. And the last one was Russian Federation. So uh, Russia is and will be extremely important for our region. Uh, even if tomorrow, theoretically, it's possible. If Even if someday Russian uh, elite, they will decide to have uh, not to impact on South Caucasus, or not to be part of decision making, or or I don't know, uh, in in South Caucasus region, Armenia included. Even if they will decide to have uh, such kind of policy, it's impossible. They will be part uh, part of uh, of the region. Geographically, for example, you cannot change Upper Lars by something. Uh, you cannot change a lot of things in this region. So. Uh, Armenia still is a member of Russian-led uh, bodies of the realm of politics. I mean, uh, Commonwealth of uh, Independent States, uh, Economics, Eurasian Economic Union, and Security, uh, uh, Collective Security Treaty uh, Organization. Sometimes it is, it is, it is formal, for example, uh, I can say it now about the Collective Security Treaty uh, Organization, but but even formally, it's important. Armenia is part of that uh, of that organization. Uh, organizations, but I would say that Russian Russia is uh, uh, Russia is very important, but it. Uh, you have less and less Russia in South Caucasus in general and in Armenia, uh, in Armenia in particular. You have uh, last 30 years or 20 years, you have more uh, Europe here, you have more Iran here, you have more Turkey here. Uh, all their impacts all the, on, on, on the South Caucasus are, are growing. In Russia, is vice versa. By the way, uh, I would say what I should that that doesn't mean uh, something necessarily good or bad. I, for example, uh, as for me, I don't know which what which Russia Russia is more dangerous for for uh, the South Caucasus: strong Russia or weak Russia. I don't know. Sometimes you see the reactions of weak Russia, and it could be. Dangerous for for some countries uh, around around Russia, what what they call near abroad or post Soviet space. Uh, second, uh, the main instrument of uh, Russians' impact of Russians' uh, pressure, if you uh, if you would like, uh, on uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan was the Golden Nagorno Karabakh was very instrumental for Russia, uh, very instrumental uh, both uh, to to to stay in Armenia and Azerbaijan because because of security, because both Armenians and Azerbaijanis they needed uh, security from Russia. I mean, weapon, political forms of security, uh, and other types of security. Uh, it was extremely important. Generally speaking, Russian way to impact on countries around uh, Russia in post-Soviet space. You have just two uh, prices on gas and security. 
in case of Azerbaijan, they didn't need to, don't need to, doesn't need now uh, their gas, they have their, their gas uh, and oil. Uh, as for Armenia, yes, this these two, uh, two things worked and Armenia was needed uh, Russia and the image of Russia was uh, an image of provider of security for Armenia uh, in the in this conflict with Azerbaijan. I, I wouldn't say that it was reality, but you had such kind of myth. Now we're, by the way, moving from one myth to another myth. From Russia will come and provide security as to the West will come and provide security for, uh, for us. So, uh, now, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, doesn't exist. I even don't mean Nagorno-Karabakh, saying Nagorno-Karabakh, I even don't mean Nagorno-Karabakh as a uh, just territory populated by ethnic Armenians. I need Nagorno-Karabakh, I, I mean Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, the subject, Artsakh. Because for, uh, if you want to peacekeep something, you need to have this something. You need to have the, you need to have this uh, this subject and uh, and came was an instrument for Russians uh, to be here to be here in the in the region. Uh, already Nagorno Karabakh does not exist. Its uh, republic doesn't exist more formally. It, it never was recognized by any country, and it doesn't exist as a de facto state. State is not exist on that territory. So situation is changing. Russia already don't have its main instrument to be a, to have a monopoly on uh, on security in in this region. It is a result of two wars: first war, twenty twenty war in Nagorno Karabakh, and second second one, Ukrainian war. Russia is busy. Uh, in the their western border, and they're not going to uh, to open second front somewhere in the south. So this uh, we are inside the process of changing of role of Russia. Generally, I would say non post Soviet uh, states. You can see, uh, for example, what's going in in, in not, not, I'm not talking just about Ukraine. You can see what's going on in Moldova. You can see what's going on in Kazakhstan. Uh, don't say about uh, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, etc. And Armenia is one of these uh, examples. You have less and less uh, Russia in this in this region. And I, I would say one more time that I don't know is it good or bad for Armenia because uh, different scenarios you can wait. Uh, and it depends on Ukrainian uh, war and how it's going to continue or not to continue. Uh, we'll see. But we are inside this uh, changes. Maybe I stop here. Thank you. Let me unmute myself. Alexander, thank you very much. Uh, I see questions coming in. Uh, please, we have a great audience here. Keep posting your questions. Tabit, I mentioned there are two to you. Anna, there's a question for you. I suggest if you... All right, I'm ready now. I can, we can show it. And then, and we'll come back at the end. Let's try it at the end and see if it's going to work, Hago. So, Nurses, uh, now over to you. Um, you make some very... I, by the way, I really encourage all of you who live in the United States, read Nurses' article. It's very prescient, very relevant, and very informative. So I encourage you to do all of them are, but if you're in the US, please read this article. So you make some very important points there. So I'm gonna read them quickly and then I'll let you respond. US policy in the South Caucasus is defined by three main pillars, regional stability, expansion of democracy and long-term peace. You make that point. Second point that I extracted in this context, the preservation and securing of Armenia's sovereignty and the security of its borders are of fundamental importance to America's interests, all right? And the third point you make, the US is addressing the problem of peace 
quote unquote, the problem of peace in the region by not forcing Azerbaijan to come to terms, but rather by strengthening Armenia's ab ability to resist Azerbaijan, which in turn will change the entire power dynamics and the coercive approach of Baku. Over to you, Nerses, to address these points. Thank you, Harai. Um, so just real quickly to provide a contextual background in us Armenia relations. It's one of the more intricate and complex ones because uh, generally Armenia relations with other countries were defined by state-to-state -state dynamics. United States Armenia relations one of the rare ones where aside from state-to-state -state dynamics because of the very large Armenian diaspora, relations have also been defined by non-state actors such as Armenian uh, ethnic lobbying organizations in DC which have uh, traditionally been uh, very active in developing U.S. fall foreign policy or affecting it. So that, that dynamic in the past had a question of the extent to which uh, the state centrism model was intricate to developing U.S. foreign policy towards Armenia, or whether U.S. foreign policy was more designed, at least at some level, appeasing American domestic audiences. The concern with this, of course, is that this struggle for the last 30 years to enhance and strengthen relations between Armenia and the U.S. Uh, and what we saw was that successive Armenian governments, until Armenia's Western pivot in 2022, consistently failed to convince Washington that Armenia should be prioritized within America's framework of what constitutes its strategic interests. So the broader attempts that we saw uh, in Washington, whether it was traditional Armenian diaspora organizations or the uh, Armenian state until the Western pivot attempting to make inroads had proven to be collectively speaking a mosaic of underperformance. In that context, uh, what Armenia has struggled to demonstrate until recently is to what extent are Armenia's interests important to American interests? And qualifying developments or understanding it through that lens offers us a bigger window uh, in a, being able to gauge why U.S. does what it does or why the U.S. doesn't do what it's supposed to do or why it doesn't meet expectations or why is it or is it meeting uh, these given expectations. So that conceptual background is very important in qualifying the relationship. Now, as uh, Harari's summary noted, U.S. policy in the South Caucasus right now is in essence defined by three pillars. U.S. considers regional stability to be its number one objective, and there are a few reasons for this. One, should you have stability in the region, you get alleviate conflict persistence. What this means is that Russia is able to maintain influence in the regions by having perpetual conflict. You remove that and have stability, Russia's influence in the region to, to a large extent diminishes. And so part of regional stability for the United States is diminishing Russian influence and potentially having a soft exit for Russia. And by soft exit, we're not talking about Russia leaving the region, that's not the point, but rather the extent to which Russia is a dominant hegemon in shaping the policies of the given actors in the region. Uh, the next pillar is the expansion of democracy. And this is not simply an ideational uh, qualifier, but the fact that democracies tend to work better with one another. So if the United States is attempting to advance its interest in the South Caucasus, it would prefer to do that with strong democracies as opposed to having transactional relationships with non-democracies. So conceptually, a democratic Armenia or a democratic Georgia, this democratic dyad that many of us talk about, are an important part of U.S. understanding of advancing their interests in the region. And of course, long-term peace, right? Uh, the understanding is that uh, if you have perpetual peace in the region, that the underlying uh, issues are addressed. Again, for some of us, this is wishful thinking, but we're talking about concrete objectives of American policy. Long-term peace will basically allow for the strengthening of both uh, regional economic considerations, uh, de democratic considerations, so on and so forth. So stability is a more direct objective. Expansion of democracy is a more intermediate objective. And of course, long-term peace is, you know, the jury's out on this, but it also remains an important part of a, a, one of the pillars that shapes U.S. policy in the region. But more importantly, what we're seeing for the first time in a very, very long time is that the pillars of American foreign policy thinking or orientation in the region actually remain commensurate with Armenia's broader objectives in the region as well. So contextualized within this, con uh, within this context, 
uh, America's broader grand strategy for the South Caucasus for the first time in a, probably forever uh, aligns with the strategic interests of Armenia. Uh, it is within that context that we're seeing Armenia's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and democracy becoming so relevant to American grand strategy. This is not simply lip service, but actually aligns with America's strategic interests. Now, more within this context is that the reason why uh, stability in the South Caucasus is important to the uh, strategic relevance of U.S. interests is that as long as you have situations where it is going to require American resources to at least mitigate conflict, or as long as it is going to allow regional actors or regional hegemons to utilize conflict to advance their interests and thus potentially mitigate uh, America's interest in a given region, uh, these uh, configurations are an important attempt by the U.S. to basically enhance its presence in a region. And it is better able to do that specifically in the South Caucasus by having regional stability. Also, the United States makes very clear that it is in its strategic interest to have uh, expansion of trade and thus make the region a commercial hub. And so for economic uh, growth to enhance itself and thus contribute to regional st st stability, the transatlantic footprint in the region requires some level of democratization and regional stability. Now, Part of this dynamic, of course, is also when, when we're gauging us Armenia relations, is the exponential increase that we have seen in American soft power within Armenia. And this soft power tends to be rather organic. Uh, several of my colleagues had mentioned uh, the IRA survey that came out. It's not just the IRA survey. There's a lot of sort of, you know, a statistical research out there and survey findings that show the United States has become one of the most dominant actors as far as our Armenia state perceptivity goes. Uh, U.S. remains very popular in Armenia. The European Union remains very popular in Armenia. So we see that the Western pivot does find a lot of support from the public. And what this means is that the West, specifically the United States, is exercising a lot of soft power influence. And so that also basically contributes to enhancing and strengthening of relations. But more to a more specific point, uh, the, the conversation that we see with my policymakers in the United States is that when we talk about the South Caucasus and specifically the Eurasian space in general, the U.S. does not have any organic allies. It has subsidized allies or partners. Its relationship with Azerbaijan, for example, is purely transactional. And values and interests of both countries tend to be diametrically opposed. But the transactional element uh, qualifies that. Uh, same with Ukraine, for example, right? U.S. Re re uh, relations with Ukraine and much of Central Asia is defined by U.S. subsidizing or providing material support or offering direct assistance as the cornerstone of maintaining these relationships. So collectively, the interactions and the engagement that the U.S. has with uh, countries in uh, Eurasia are defined by not pure alignment of interest or alliance conception, conceptualizations, but rather transactional elements. You know, Ukraine is a functional buffer against Russian expansionism, right? Uh, Azerbaijan is utilized as a potential uh, mechanism of containment against Iran. These are instrumentalized approaches. With respect to Armenia, right, Armenia provides an organic base for potentially growing American public support and American soft power in the region. And this is a very cost effective and sustainable model for the United States because it does not need to invest the level of resources that it does for its other partners in the region. So qualified within this perspective, Armenia is becoming a lot more interesting uh, uh, subject of consideration when we talk about U.S. Uh, regional grant strategy. And then uh, within this context, uh, when we want to qualify uh, the, the diminishing of Russian influence in the region, and this is clearly uh, tied to the West's overarching approach with respect to Russia, uh, the understanding is that the, so Russia's entire southern uh, Caucasus security architecture is hinged on Armenia being a cornerstone of its southern security flank. And so if Armenia or this cornerstone is removed from that security architecture, Russia's security architecture to, to a large extent collapses in the region. And this is precisely what we're seeing. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Alexander mentioned this uh, 
the continuous diminishing of, of Russian influence in the region, right, isn't only about the Ukraine war. It's the fact that the previous hegemon almost has very little influence on Armenia. It has very little influence on Azerbaijan. While they collaborate, it's reciprocal, and its relationship or its influence on Georgia is also highly transactional. So conceptually, Russia has be been reduced from being the most dominant actor to one that is struggling to sustain its influence. And this is precisely aligned with what the United States is seeking in a region. So advancing a, a us armenia relations and deepening it is not only specific to bilateral considerations, but also to produce geopolitical pluralism in the region. And finally, to kind of uh, wrap, up, wrap up the uh, conversation to address the last question that Harad had posed, uh, the United States right now fully accepts Armenia's Western pivot as being genuine, substantive, and playing an instrumental role uh, in advancing U.S.-Armenia interests. At the same time, we're seeing that uh, while Armenia's pivot is opening a lot of uh, uh, doors that Armenia did not have in the past with respect to accessing hard power capabilities, the United States is more than willing to engage with Armenia in enhancing its security architecture, in enhancing its capabilities, but this also does not translate at the same time to punishing Azerbaijan. And so American policy here, this quote unquote addressing the problem of peace is actually quite nuanced. And while it might seem to be contradictory, America's approach is very, very different. Their argument is that while the, uh, the United States fully supports Armenia's claims vis-a-vis -vis Azerbaijan's aggressive demeanor, the United States is not ready to punish Azerbaijan for this demeanor. In that context, we have a very important phenomenon here. You have a region, right, that has issues of instability and severe power asymmetry, whereas Azerbaijan for the last 20 years has exponentially enhanced its security capabilities, while Armenia being in Russia's dependency structure and for multiple reasons failed to basically maintain the power parity. And so the discourse here is that if the United States wants stability in the region, if it wants peace in the region, you can't have those if you have power asymmetry between countries. So there are approaches that punishing Azerbaijan isn't going to produce a sustainable outcome. It's not going to produce peace. What's going to produce peace is if you close this power parity and you have a relative balance of power. And so the discourse is shifting to not about punishing Azerbaijan, but strengthening Armenia's capacity to resist Azerbaijan's maximalist or bellicose approaches. So in that context, uh, we're seeing a growing presence of the United States as being an important figure or an important actor in Armenia's security architecture, which is a very new phenomenon when we consider the 30, 35 year history of us Armenia relations. And I'll stop here and I'll be happy to address questions as they come up. Well, Nerses, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a very broad, comprehensive view of the Armenia-US uh, relationship. So uh, for the audience, we have a great audience. Uh, I see your questions. Uh, keep posting them. And uh, at the end, I'm not going to read those questions. It's going to take too much time. So to the, uh, to the panelists, please go through. Uh, some of them are specifically addressed to some of you, you know, as you as you uh, make your presentations, and some of them are more general. Uh, take a couple of minutes to answer them, so we answer as many of them as we can. Uh, but uh, but uh, I will not. I will not. I do not plan to read them. I'm gonna. Like I said, it's gonna take too much time. So we're gonna move on right now, and we have Yeria uh, Tashian on the agenda. Yeria, you cover the very important, very important Armenian India. Uh, relationships. That's a developing uh, story, and uh, and so you you address that, and you make some important points that I'm going to quickly read here. In recent years, a strong political bond has been established between Yerevan and New Delhi. Your point now. That's one thing I extracted from your article. The second one in India's involvement in the South Caucasus has both geopolitical and geoeconomic dimensions. It aims to establish itself as a reliable defense player globally and secure its national interests by containing the expansion of Turkish, Azerbaijan, Pakistan axis. Very interesting point. I think you all should listen to what Yeri has to say about that axis, uh, which is very relevant to uh, Armenia's security. 
The third point you make, the proposed international north-south transport corridor, which will provide development opportunities for all communities from the north to the south of Armenia. That's the third. And the fourth, according to Armenia's Prime Minister Pashinyan, this project will enhance communication between Armenia and neighboring countries and diffuse tensions in the South Caucasus. Over to you, Yahya. Thank you, Harar. Thank you also for the ARPA Institute for inviting me to this citing family uh, panel. So we'll be talking briefly about uh, geopolitical and geocomic background of the Armenia-India uh, partnership. So many Indians actually view uh, Armenia as a stronghold against uh, Turkey's pan-Turkic, let's say, aspirations in the region, uh, Turkey's rapprochement uh, with Pakistan and President uh, Erdogan's remarks on Kashmir have created a certain anxiety, we can say, among uh, Indian uh, policy makers. And I be I remember this was very clear when first time I visited New Delhi in February 2020, where still uh, Armenia and uh, Indian defense relations were very immature. Even talking about uh, them, people would be very surprised. So uh, the 2020 war and Armenia's defeat in nagorno um and also uh, against Turkey and Pakistani backed Azerbaijan raised some concerns in uh, New Delhi about the intention of this axis that was emerging uh, in the region. However, one should also bear in mind that uh, India's involvement in South Caucasus uh, and its military backup to Armenia is not only limited to geopolitical factors. Uh, New Delhi has also geocomic interests uh, in the uh, region within the north-south uh, connectivity, uh, trade linking the Indian Ocean to northern Russia and uh, the Baltic Sea. So first, let's identify uh, India's uh, geoeconomic and geopolitical uh, interests in the uh, region. As we said, India's main geoeconomic interest um, in South Caucasus is the realization of the International North-South Transport uh, Corridor. This is not a new initiative. Actually, this initiative goes back to 2000, 2001, when Russia, Iran, and India, they drafted uh, this project, which is like 7,200 kilometers of uh, model of ship network and rail and uh, Railroad and road project to facilitate trade in Eurasia. Mm -hmm. Iran actually is a key transit player uh, in this uh, connectivity, and Armenia also can become a potential uh, player. There were many articles published in the Indian uh, newspapers about this issue, why Armenia can play important transit role. But also geopolitically, they stress a lot on the three brothers, which is Turkey, Pakistan, and uh, uh, Azerbaijan, and Armenia should become the stronghold uh to uh deter or contain the influence of this excess or alliance uh in the region uh, moreover also expansion of BRICS in january uh, 2024 i believe that should also give additional motivation uh, for armenia to apply uh, to such structures even as an observer member to increase its also economic and political interaction with rising eurasian powers such as i mean india and uh china and I believe that this can be also uh, seen as an important step in the sense of positioning Armenia uh, in a regional multipolar uh, system and also sending a clear signals to Moscow that Yerevan does not intend to join anti-Russian alliance and is even ready to cooperate with other supra-regional organizations where Russia values its uh, membership uh, in, uh, in the multipolar world view. Uh, the question now is about uh, the north-south transport uh, route uh, corridor where uh, Armenia is trying to push uh, this initiative. So given the challenges uh, posed by Armenia's infrastructure and the lack of railway connection with uh, some of its neighboring countries, mainly Iran, compared to Azerbaijan's crucial role in the international north-south transport corridor. So Yerevan is pushing actually uh, for alternative corridor, which is called... Um, the Black Sea Persian Gulf uh, corridor, which connects uh, Georgia to Iran uh, via Armenia's ambitions, a uh, north-south uh, transport road uh, corridor. 
So this road is actually one of the largest projects in the history of independent uh, Armenia. This project aims to reduce also the distance from Iran uh, to uh, Georgia and also would simplify Armenia's access to the Black Sea and the Persian uh, uh, Gulf, even the Middle East and the Asian markets. So India and Iran actually are encouraging Armenia to take active role in this transport uh, link. And already in late uh, January 2024, Iran granted Armenia access uh, to its Jahapar and the Bandar Ambas uh, port to facilitate Armenia's uh, trade uh, uh, with uh, neighboring uh, countries. So the implementation of this project, I mean, it's very long, but I uh, wrote actually a book chapter uh, will be published soon about it on the human security in Armenia, especially in the bordering villages in Sunik and uh, so on. So the implementation will also improve the socioeconomic condition in the villages and uh, rural area, and most importantly, in the strategic uh, uh, Sunni. To talk very briefly about the security dimension, I'm not a military expert, but Armenia had shown interest in the Indian weaponry even before the 2020 war. We already remember in March 2020, Yerevan signed a $40 uh, million uh, dollar arms deal uh, to supply the Swati radar to detect actually location of uh, weapons. And after the May 2021 and September 2022 Azerbaijan incursions on uh, Armenian territory and Russia's inability to supply us with uh, advanced uh, weapons, Armenia started searching alternative uh, defense uh, market and aimed to diversify its security partners. India was actually one of the best uh, candidates, so Armenia bought a lot uh, of uh, Pinaka uh, multi barrel rocket launchers. Um, uh, and I will not name, uh, there were a lot of uh, howitzers, but most important, the Akash uh, missile, which was also reported in the Indian uh, media. Uh, this is very important because uh, Akash missile is a, like an anti air defense system and it effectively engages with uh, not just uh, UAVs, but also fighter jets and helicopters. And according to the data, the range, uh, uh, it's in the range of 4 to 25 kilometers and is also immune to active and passive uh, jamming. So with the uh, deepening of these military uh, relations, both countries also uh, can find ways to strengthen their security ties, such as intelligence sharing, joint military exercises, and also Armenian officers, I mean, graduating from Indian military schools and also inviting uh, Indian military advisors to Yerevan. Uh, to conclude or uh, reflect, uh, the defense partnership, actually, or the relationship is uh, between India and Armenia is a testament for also India's growing uh, role in the global defense uh, sector and Armenia's strategy to diversify uh, its defense partnerships. Uh, geopolitically, by arming Armenia, Yerevan is, will become also a deterrent force against uh, the three brothers, as uh, India calls. And within this context, uh, the Indian Armenian arms trade can be also a win-win solution for both uh, countries. And here it is also important to highlight that maybe uh, Moscow may realize in the future that India's involvement in the region and its positive economic ties with India and even Azerbaijan when it comes to energy security may stabilize uh, the South Caucasus through uh, the North-South uh, connectivity and also reversing the current uh, military balance uh, in the region. Thank you. You're mute, Harai. You're mute. I am sorry. Thank you, Yeria. I uh, appreciate it very much. So we're going to move on. Uh, next is Sosi Tatikian. And Sosi, I want to thank you right up front. Sosi stepped in the last minute to cover a very important topic. Armina AU relationship it was a gap in, in our uh, uh, report. So Sosi stepped in and uh, uh, she was very kind to do it very fast. So, Sosia, I have uh, three questions for you. Uh, uh, the, the European Union launched a civilian mission in Armenia. It's called EUMA in your article. And you go over the reasons of the EU's interest in deploying, in deploying such a mission. So you go into that. Second point is you explain how the EUMA fits within the common security and defense policy. And then the third, you raise the issue, how far can Armenia go with its EU aspirations, question mark. 
Will it see close relationship or membership? Question mark. So see over to you. Thank you very much. And um, I feel uh, I've been dealing with this topic both as a policy expert, uh, working with EU uh, completely uh, on voluntary basis as, uh, as part of informal diplomacy in the last three years, as well as uh, writing some policy and academic articles about the topic. And just two weeks ago, all EU member state ambassadors uh, to political and security committee of the European Union visited uh, Armenia and uh, we briefed them, uh, requested by the, the EU delegation and Alexander was also there uh, about our perspectives uh, on Armenia's foreign and security policy and the situation. So I'm happy to talk about this mission, uh, about this topic. And Armenia-EU relations have uh, various aspects because Armenia has this agreement, uh, comprehensive partnership agreement with the EU, which has a lot of different aspects such as economy, uh, uh, trade. However, I, I am not an expert in economy and trade, so I will focus on two aspects. Security issues, in particular EU mission in Armenia, but not only, because EU has a wider role. And the second, uh, EU, e Armenia's newly shaping aspirations for the EU membership. Uh, this mission uh, is something we have advocated for several as experts and civil society um, figures in Armenia, and I, I've been one of them. We have advocated for it both to our authorities and to the European Union. And to be frank, I believe this mission is the best thing EU has ever done for Armenia. At the same time, it's important to understand what it is to avoid exaggerated, unrealistic expectations and uh, be very realistic about the role of the mission. Uh, so uh, when Azerbaijan started creeping annexation of border areas of Armenia in 2021, Armenia first expected CSTO or Russia to intervene and support Armenia as its ally according to CSTO uh, ob obligations, but it didn't happen. And we can analyze uh, reasons uh, for a long time, but the bottom line is that uh, CSTO uh, member states have more common uh, values as well as geopolitical interests with Azerbaijan than with Armenia in the last several years. Uh, it's uh, basically most of the countries uh, in CSTO are uh, autocratic to various degree, perhaps uh, Kazakhstan being uh, the best uh, in that picture. Uh, also because uh, at least half of its members are Turkic uh, states with obvious uh, common interests with Azerbaijan. And uh, also in light of the changes and transformation in Armenia-Russia, uh, relationship and Russia's stigmatization on international scene. Uh, so uh, Russian CSTO didn't even acknowledge even during the meetings uh, in the UN Security Council that Azerbaijan has clearly violated Armenia's territorial integrity even after September 23 invasion of Azerbaijan in Jermuk. Uh, the Secu UN Security Council meeting was convened uh, by France, not by Russia. And uh, the, the positions of the US, uh, France, and EU member, uh, uh, members of the UN Security Council were more supportive for Armenia than those of, uh, um, those of Russia. A uh, Russian uh, representative would even repeat some uh, Azerbaijani narratives during uh, UN Security Council meetings, both on Armenia's territorial integrity and also uh, later on in 2000, um, 
13, uh, since December 22, about uh, the blockade and military offensive uh, in Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, therefore, uh, Armenia was frustrated and uh, According to reports, it was uh, U.S. Uh, C uh, Secretary of State Blinken who played an instrumental role in stopping the military offensive in Jermuk by Azerbaijan. Uh, and also EU made quite clear statements about it. Now, when we re remember e EU's and U.S. positions to Nagorno-Karabakh issue, to be very frank, it was quite. They were quite uh, frustrating because they were trying to use this liberal peace theory with Azerbaijan, which is obviously an autocratic, uh, aggressive, militaristic state, and it failed. And we were warning the U.S. and EU in our informal diplomatic. Uh, uh, capacity as experts that it was going to fail and that's exactly what happened. However, uh, US and EU uh, have been showing more clear and uh, more or less robust position to Armenia's territorial integrity. How? Uh, why is it that? First of all, it's about the principle of territorial integrity, which became kind of an absolute principle in light of the war in Ukraine because all other principles, uh, self-determination, etc., kind of lost their importance and were undermined, and territorial integrity and sovereignty became number one principles. Second, US and EU were, of course, a lot, uh, criticized a lot for their soft uh, mediation and diplomacy in Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, uh, in particular, EU was criticized for its uh, gas uh, deal with Azerbaijan in July 2022, 20, after which Azerbaijan started uh, the blockade of Nagorno-Karabakh and before that uh, launched uh, invasion in Jermuk. And uh, EU uh, has been positioning itself as a normative actor uh, that is promoting liberal values of democracy and human rights. Uh, and of course, Armenia is considered uh, the, the democratic country uh, in the region. Uh, well, it's always a competition between Armenia and Georgia in the last uh, several years, who is more democratic. Uh, sometimes it's us, sometimes it's them. It depends on the year. And uh, uh, EU had to to to to balance between its uh, geopolitical and normative roles, and uh, also uh, it realized most likely that another large scale war may ha happen in the European neighborhood, and it would just add to the burden of the the EU as well as the US. Uh, uh, after in light of the war in Ukraine, and it would uh, become very difficult to manage. That's why the EU stepped in. Well, of course, uh, the Prague uh, statement is controversial. Uh, it was adopted uh, on 8 uh, October, uh, three weeks after the invasion in Jermuk, and we know that Armenia recognized uh, Azerbaijan's territorial integrity, and uh, by the same statement, it was decided to deploy EU mission in um, Armenia. I have to say that um, this was an unprecedented decision by the EU because of several factors. First of all, because Azerbaijan didn't want this mission. However, there were those few days after the Jermuk invasion when it was possible to convince Azerbaijan to agree uh, on the deployment of the mission on the Armenian side, not on the border, because uh, the ideal uh, situation would be if the mission would be deployed on the border and also on Azerbaijani side, but uh, it was not possible to convince Azerbaijan. So, but that, uh, but EU wanted some kind of green light from Azerbaijan, even for deploying it in Armenia, and uh, Aliyev kind of uh, agreed. Uh, during the week following uh, the Jermuk invasion, I'm sure it, uh, it, he has regretted about it deeply. 
and uh, the mission was deplo uh, the, then uh, the, there there was a need for consensus uh, by the EU member states because EU is a consensus based organization and uh, no country should veto uh, a deployment of the mission and of course there were a lot of um, concerns especially about Hungary with which Armenia had uh, suspended diplomatic relations in relation to the murder of uh, officer Margarian by Ramik Safarov, as well as other countries such as Italy that gets a lot of gas from Azerbaijan. However, the consensus was achieved and EU deployed uh, very, very quickly. This was unprecedented by its speed for the EU. First, they deployed uh, 40 uh, monitors, deducted them from the mission in Georgia, and then there was another uh, political decision in December uh, about deployment of a long-term mission, and uh, EU launched its uh, real, uh, its proper mission in Armenia in February 23. Moreover, it decided to uh, expand its uh, this mission uh, after uh, the military offensive in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, and uh, from 100, uh, it, it is expanded to 209. Uh, 23 EU member countries are contributing to the mission. And also Canada uh, is contributing with uh, one uh, advisor and soon Norway, which is not an EU member, will also contribute. Uh, so what is the role of this mission? It is civilian, not armed. Uh, as uh, Aliyev teased them uh, three days ago, they do binocle diplomacy. That's what Aliyev said. Uh, so it's a monitoring mission. Uh, they uh, can conduct patrols and they report to Brussels. Uh, uh, our illiberal opposition uh, spread this information in April 23 that they are spying for Azerbaijan. However, uh, the reports are not seen not only by Azerbaijan, but even by Armenia. The reports go st straight to Brussels, to EU member countries. Before this mission was deployed, Azerbaijan was spreading this information all the time that anything that happens on the border, any military accident and disinformation is provoked by Armenia. And Armenia was not able to prove that it's Azerbaijan and Armenia has no interest to uh, to provoke any incident. However, uh, EU member countries were confused and didn't know whom, whom to, to believe. Now it's more or less clear because uh, although EU mission uh, avoids uh, making uh, explicit uh, political statements, however, they... Uh, Every day, literally every day, there is a delegation from some EU member country and it has become kind of like a conflict sightseeing. They go and visit EU HQ, which is not in Yerevan, which is a good thing. It's in Yeregnadzor and it has field offices in Ijevan, in Kapan, in Goris, etc. And uh, they show and they, they brief them and they uh, explain the situation, which is very positive. Uh, and not uh, surprisingly, uh, Russia and Azerbaijan have launched uh, increasing and intensifying a hybrid war against this mission, uh, disinformation, false narratives, and uh, especially in the last several months uh, after the collapse of the Nagorno-Karabakh, they are very focused to delegitimize this mission. Uh, so uh, why uh, this mission is a soft deterrent for Armenia's border security. Uh, given the military imbalance between Armenia and Azerbaijan, there are only two, three factors that actually prevent uh, Azerbaijan to attack Armenia. Well, of course, one of them is Iran. One of them is uh, the political position uh, of the U.S. and EU, and finally this mission, because uh, it really it cannot do anything if Azerbaijan attacks. And three days ago, uh, Aliyev again mentioned in his statement that 
uh, EU monitors should actually be grateful to Ali, uh, Azerbaijan that they are not targeted by Azerbaijan. So Azerbaijan even uses a very threatening language about them. However, uh, the assumption is that it's exactly because Azerbaijan has e uh, uh, this gas deal with EU, and it also uh, has a new initiative, this so-called meat corridor, it is now trying to position itself as an important actor in this mid corridor connecting Central Asia, uh, the Caucasus uh, and Europe. It will avoid doing something completely uh, explicitly violating all uh, red lines uh, because it realizes that there will be political costs for it. Um, about Armenia's EU aspirations. Uh, first of all, it's related also to CSTO membership and uh, also Eurasian Customs uh, Union uh, membership. Um, as we know, Armenia has suspended its membership in uh, CSTO, not legally, but de facto, since uh, November 2020. And uh, most likely at one point Armenia will walk away from CSTO legally. In any case, uh, to be frank, uh, the West, to my impression, doesn't even pressure Armenia any longer to quit uh, CSTO because uh, the West considers that it's kind of a done deal. Armenia is not participating in any CSTO activity and is hasn't received any military or security assistance from CSTO for many, many years. And uh, CSTO tried to send uh, a, a monitoring mission to Armenia, but only uh, after it realized that EU will deploy a mission. So basically it was an attempt by CSTO and Russia to prevent the deployment of the EU mission. However, Armenia had already made its choice and it was already frustrated with CSTO. Uh, so CSTO is not a big problem. A more uh, significant problem, although again, I'm not an economist, is uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Why? Because Armenian economy is completely, completely part of this Eurasian market. Armenian economy receives about two, three billion um, do, uh, euros, uh, dollars per year uh, from this market. And if Armenia withdraws from this uh, union, Armenian economy will simply collapse. So it's not something like CSTO. It cannot just, Armenia cannot just boycott and suspend its membership uh, quickly. It should do, uh, uh, just uh, try to diversify its economy and uh, redirect its market very, very gradually. And that's exactly why this April 5 meeting with uh, State Secretary Blinken and uh, EU took place. And uh, EU and Armenia are trying to help Armenia to uh, de develop its economic resilience to diversify its economy uh, after diversifying its uh, security. So returning security, as we know, France was the first country, uh, EU member country and Western country that broke the taboo and uh, sold military equipment to a CSTO member country. This is really invaluable. However, it's, it's important to note here that even not all EU member countries are excited about this. Uh, some there is some uh, internal criticism uh, addressed to France, although Italy and Bulgaria on their turn sell military equipment to Azerbaijan, from which Italy is selling Leonardo's, which is uh, very significant and very serious. So I think I talked too long. Uh, and about uh, membership, uh, I will add that uh, Armenia expressed EU membership aspirations for the first time informally, uh, hinting about it in November last year. And it hasn't uh, applied for it formally. And it's considering what is the good momentum to apply for it. And 
of course, there is no any guarantee that the EU uh, membership will be successful for Armenia and it will happen anytime soon because uh, we know that EU has very strict uh, criteria called Copenhagen criteria and any country that has become an EU member uh, state uh, since the, uh, the, the end of the Cold War has passed through this very long road and it's both uh, political and economic and uh, rule of law and democracy criteria. Uh, it's a long way and however if Armenia uh, misses the train which already kind of missed because uh, Ukraine, Moldova and even Georgia received the invitation uh, but Armenia is still uh, uh, shaping its aspirations it will be uh, it will basically mean that Armenia will get stuck in regionalism and in the region uh, it's surrounded with uh, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Iran and even if it's an it's a friendly country to us but it's still autocratic and uh, and it will be very difficult for Armenia. Uh, so however, see, I, so see, yeah? uh, we need to uh, if you can take a, a... Uh, 30 seconds just to end it yeah. so we can uh, yeah. address I some was of the questions. Yeah, please. Sure. Yeah, uh, so, but I also agree with Yeria that even if Armenia takes this road to EU membership, it should not just cooperate with the West. It should try uh, a multipolar uh, foreign and security diplomacy. It should continue to uh, develop its uh, relationship with India and Iran in particular. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Sosi. Uh, Hagop, uh, regarding yeah. the next day thing, I recommend you post that with the posting here. The, we're going to run out of time very quickly. Let's uh, let's so, run it and then... What well, about so let me start off with the order. We had this and uh, please... Uh, maybe take uh, some closing remarks and quickly address the issues that were raised to you specifically. So a few minutes. So we don't want to go too much over. Uh, we have about maybe 10, 15 minutes left. So Tavit, let's start with you. Tavit, are you good? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, uh, just a uh, Couple of minutes closing remarks, and you, there were questions addressed to you. If you want to uh, address them quickly, please go ahead, and then we'll move on. Is a question by Anna Ohanian for you, David? Yes. Okay. I, I saw the questions. Thank you, Anna. And I think there are two questions. One is about the Turkey as an energy transit hub, and the second was from. Another person about the shift in Erdogan's uh, politics or policy uh, from zero problems to problems with everyone. Uh, on the first, I think question, uh, Turkey indeed. I I got I went into much deeper analyzing the differences between possible differences or fault lines between Azerbaijan and Turkey, but naturally they have many things in common, and one of them is the the Turkish intention to be the energy hub, and for now it is Baku, Tbilisi, Jehan, and also the gas, the natural gas pipeline. But potentially, as Sosi also mentioned, the middle corridor from Kazakhstan. For now, Kazakhstan is mostly forced to send through Russian pipelines to the Black Sea, but they are exploring the option to send the oil to Azerbaijan, to Turkey, and further to Europe also, which gives them alternative. And thank is oil field is one of the largest in the world. So that's why I think Azerbaijan and Turkey are connected. In addition to this, China has invested in the last few years a lot in Azerbaijan, in Georgia, and Turkey under the Belt and Road. I think uh, a billion plus in Georgia and Azerbaijan, and a few billions in Turkey also. And this is beyond energy also. It is more the Chinese goods going to Azerbaijan, to, to Turkey, to Europe also. So a lot is happening there, and I think we have to be mindful. For me, it is important that we are not totally missed out from the, those opportunities also. We spoke a lot about the criticality of the Zangezur corridor and not giving concessions also, but 
from the other side, there could be some lost opportunities. Uh, but second question, from zero problem to many problems with all the neighbors, I think there are two reasons from my take. One is this Erdogan's very erratic like behavior usually. I mean, in economy, for the first few years, he adopted very rational scientific <laughs> approach to economic. And Turkey managed to make a big leap in economic development his first few years of leadership. And then after he moved to more faith-based decisions, I mean, controlling interest rate, hyperinflation, etc. And the same thing, it happened again. He's back and forth. He's uh, like the, the, the personality somehow matters in this case. But in addition to this, I think it was also the new opportunities from his from Erdogan's perspective, like Arab Spring, collapsing Syria, uh, Libya, etc. He felt this is the moment he can grab things. And then he got into Syria, first to control the Kurds, but also to get some parts of the Syrian sovereign state under the Turkish control, etc. So th <laughs> that's why, to me, it is a mix of personality of Erdogan, <laughs> but also some opportunities. And eventually, the world moved from this rational, normal, normal, normalcy <laughs> to grabbing what you can. I mean, Russia and many others, Azerbaijan, etc. And one, <laughs> sorry. One uh, concluding remark I want to make about overall our discussion. I think we have to be mindful not to divide the world on friends and enemies and try to look opportunities all. It includes Turkey, it includes Azerbaijan, China also, all Israel, which is seen as a friend of Azerbaijan and by default the enemy of ours. Etc. So there are many opportunities, I think, around us. So we have many challenges also. And in each case, we have to do our best to explore and identify what are specific, like Armenia and Israel, Armenia and Turkey, Armenia and Azerbaijan, whether we can find anything in common and helping both of us to move forward and how to exploit and then to build some sort of connecting uh, and joint agendas also. It is, of course, not easy, and there are many challenges, emotional, historic, and recent also war-related. But for me, this is the right way forward. Thank, so, you, thank, thank you. Th th thank you, David. Thank you very much. Anna, over to you, uh, clo your closing remarks. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for closing remarks, uh, I will add uh, some uh, issues concerning uh, uh, peculiarities of Iran's policy in our region. Uh, in my report, I write also about uh, Iran-France cooperation, and I mentioned that ambassadors of France and Iran uh, met uh, during the September 2023 and also posted about the meeting. And uh, I had an opportunity to be present at um, the discussion with the ambassador of Iran and asked about the political message of not only meeting of the ambassadors, uh, but also decision to have a press release about it. And so ambassador replied that this is a clear message to Armenian uh, public that uh, uh, Iran's and France attitude towards Armenia's security are very much alike. And also about the issue spoke uh, also the ambassador of France uh, during the uh, uh, an interview last month. And so this is a very important um, feature uh, in our region, cooperation of countries that have... Um, many problems with uh, each other uh, in different other areas, but having the same attitude towards the territorial integrity of Armenia and security issues of Armenia. And I also wanted to mention that it's also interesting and I guess important to mention that uh, uh, related to the April 5 trilateral meeting in Brussels, meeting between uh, EU, US, and also Armenia, we had very strong condemnation 
and condemning statements coming from Turkey and Russia. Uh, but uh, as I understand, Iran's, Iran refused to join such kind of uh, condemnations at, and uh, had only a statement coming from the spokesperson, a spokesperson of MFA saying that Iran is opposing extra regional military presence. And so that was one more important political message to show that there are um, an upper, there are opportunities for cooperation also between the EU and Iran in our region. Uh, and con uh, concerning the question I have uh, from Chris Zavik, uh, why um, Azerbaijan uh, prefers uh, this extra corridorial, uh, extraterritorial corridor um, over the transit route uh, pass passing through Iran. So um, for several reasons, but first of all, uh, it it's the extraterritorial corridor Azerbaijan imagines and demands from Armenia is something totally different from transit route um, uh, logic, and it will be, uh, they want it to be unimpended without an, any customs control. And um, also this will be very important political gain, not only for Azerbaijan, but all, uh, also for the uh, overall Turkic uh, so-called uh, Turan strategy in, in the region. And also when uh, considering the possibility of involving this corridor in the so-called middle corridor strategy, it is important to have a part that is, uh, that is bypassing any sanctioned country. So it's not only about Iran's political and economic leverage on uh, Azerbaijan, but also a fact that it, the route passes through country, this time Iran, that is under, under sanctions. Um, and also um, not to uh, diminish the importance of Iran's uh, political and economic leverage having this uh, transit route. And so that's why uh, Iran also says that this uh, project of Armenian government called Crossroads of Peace, it's the only way uh, Iran will support the deblocking of uh, communication in the region. We can argue that this is because Iran perceives it unrealistic project because even this status quo of having a blockade of communication in the region is in the interest of Iran. So we can argue, the, is it uh, this way or uh, the logic of the project indeed is uh, in line of their interest, but in coming from the high level statements, they stress that this is the only way they will support the, the blocking of communication. So, and thank you for- uh, Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anna, very thank you. And yeah, thank you for your comments. Yep, yep, yep. Let's move on. Alexander, over to you. Any any closing remarks from your end? Uh, okay. Uh, questions from Karo. Uh, uh, Armenia said territories in an effort to sign a peace according with Azerbaijan. Does the strategy of land for peace work? No. Uh, Azerbaijan does need peace. Uh, then, what do dear Alexa, what do you think the Russian gained in return of leaving NK before November 25? Uh, there are rumors that Turks wanted to open, uh, or Azerbaijanis wanted Turkey to open a military base uh, in Azerbaijan. I'm not uh, supporter of conspiracy theory. Theories, I really think nothing. Uh, the the uh, P 
peacekeeping forces, Russian keep, so-called peacekeeping forces, they were dysfunctional after the deportation of, after the exodus of Armenian population. And maybe it was part of gain, of, uh, uh, but in, in, in different format, because, you know, if, if you look from Armenia, if you look from Yerevan, this questions could be existential, existential for Armenians, but for Russia, it's part of very white uh, mosaic of Rus Ar Ru Russian, Turkish, Russian, Azerbaijani, uh, carbons, etc. situation. So it could be somewhere in, in different place, but generally, I don't think that uh, it was a real deal. Uh, and for economy, I'm not an economist, but uh, Last thing I want to say uh, about Azerbaijan as a petro state, uh, monarchy, and co collapsing uh, such kind of states, economies, etc. Uh, the main problem of Armenia, I would say, is not even conflict with Azerbaijan now. The main conflict of Armenia, it's a conflict of, I would call it, time paradigms. I'll try to explain in a couple of sentences. Uh, Everything which Armenia can do by weapon, uh, build reforms in army, uh, political forms of security, uh, diplomatic artificial structures or formats for security, etc., uh, economy development, uh, meritocracy, uh, problems with elites, etc. All these you in principle can do in short period. All these programs can be long-term programs. You need at least years, if not generations for them. Risks are extremely short. Azerbaijan can do what Azerbaijan can do in two hours. That's a problem. Uh, that's the main problem. Uh, because you can do a lot of things, give, give territories to Azerbaijan, give, I, I don't know, the delimited the, the border, etc., etc. But the problem of this time paradigm conflict is here at its main problem, and maybe Azerbaijan will collapse as Venezuela or, I don't know, the, uh, other petro states in, in 20 years or 200 years, but maybe we will have our problems in, in in a week. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nerses, over to you. A uh, couple of minutes, closing remarks, anything big picture you want to uh, state? Thank you. Harari. Uh There were two quick questions I wanna, uh, I'll address. One pertains to the success of Georgia's lobbying efforts in the United States and why how Armenia, having more bit stronger of a diaspora, has had uh, relatively speaking weaker outcomes. Um, Georgia has had strong support from the U.S. Senate. Armenia has always struggled to have strong support in the Senate. In that context, uh, Georgia has always had the issue that they are a pro-Western, pro-U.S. actor, and that has worked in D.C. Our, our problem is that from the uh, co-chair of the administration all, we, all the way to the, the revolution. In, in D.C., we were viewed as a Russian satellite. And as a Russian satellite, that perceptivity diminished your capacity to lobby well. In that context, we lost the narrative in D.C., therefore our lobbying efforts struggled because of that component. And uh, in that context, Georgians were ahead of the game, while Armenia was basically telling the United States to support a Russian ally that was uh, working to advance Russia's interests in the region. That was not going to work. This is why we have not been successful in D.C. in relative terms. And then the question does ask, you know, uh, how do we do we need to improve law being in D.C.? Most definitely. Uh, if we're going to look at this purely in empirical terms, our law being institutions to a large extent have failed. Uh, there was no outcome in the 2020 war. The Armenian caucus uh, was not very productive. We have not had any legislation passed that has produced any success. These are just empirical assessments. So there needs to be severe uh, paradigm shifts in the modality of lobbying organizations because Azerbaijan has been defeating Armenia in the lobbying game in D.C. for the last 20 years. Uh, whatever the strategic differences are, that's a different subject of conversation. But right now, that remains uh, the factual basis. And I, I'm depoliticizing this. I'm basically going uh, off of the outcomes that we have seen and the diminishing influence of Armenian lobby when it comes to uh, advocating for the uh, Republic of Armenia. 
And so a big part of that has been the perception that Armenia is a Russian vassal. Now, uh, the next question uh, kind of ties into this that was asked is, what are the risks of Armenia's Western pivot? And is it dangerous to, to basically rely on the United States? I think there's a general misunderstanding of what the Western pivot constitutes. It's not about asking the United States to be Armenia's security guarantor. The Western pivot is to leave Russia, Russia's sphere of influence to no longer be a Russian vassal and thus to exercise independent foreign policy. Thus, the pivot is directional. It is a directional shift towards an independent foreign policy. But because that pivot has to be towards the West, that is the objective. And as Solsi noted, the Russian-led security architecture completely collapsed. So either Armenia pivots and diversifies its foreign security policy, or it remains in a state of severe vulnerability. So the only way Armenia could address the security problems that we face from Azerbaijan is to develop deterrence capabilities. You can't do that in Russia's sphere or as a Russian vassal. That we saw that it failed. And so our, our access to hard power capabilities, our ability to develop the trans capacity required a pivot away from Russia and towards a more independent foreign policy. This is why the pivot is qualified as being Western, that it is directionally away from Russia. It's not ideational saying Armenia is embracing the West as a security guarantor. Those conversations are untrue and suggest a misunderstanding. So uh, in that context, right, the relationships with Europe, the relationship with the United States, the growing relationship with Canada, et cetera, et cetera, it's about not putting all of your eggs in one basket like we did for 30 years, but rather having access to the various security partners that could address and help you mitigate the large number of problems you have. So contextually, when it comes to the big picture, we need to understand that Armenia is devassalizing, right? We are no longer a Russian satellite. And in that context, we, are, we need to have a conversation about Armenia's strategic interests and no longer about Russia's strategic interests. For 25 years, Armenia foreign policy was reliant on Russia. You could do what Russia told you to do. And you cannot do what Russia told you to do. So anytime you try to exercise independence, Russia will smack you down. We saw this in 2013 when Sarkisyan, right, a very pro-Russian president, tried to do a very simple pivot towards Europe. We saw what happened. It was immediately clobbered. So the, argue, the logic is, is that either you continue remaining an extension of Russia or you establish independence. And we saw that being an extension of Russia proved to be detrimental to our security environment and continue to be perpetuated. Alexander mentioned this. Solsi mentioned this. This is very, very straightforward. So this isn't a pro-West, pro-East posturing. This is about understanding Armenia's ability to formulate a policy that gives us access to capabilities that otherwise we have no access to by virtue of being an extension of Russia. And finally, there was a question uh, about the nature of uh, U.S.-Armenia relations and uh, whether it's organic or transactional. I'll be very quick on this. Transactional relationships are hard to maintain and they're resource intense, whereas organic relations tend to be more sustainable in the long run and they're less resource intense. The scholarly literature supports this uh, conceptualization. And so Armenia in that context uh, is more conducive to being an organic ally to the United States because we do not have any transactional demands, whereas countries like Saudi Arabia, like Azerbaijan, et cetera, are very resource intense uh, allies or partners. And so the organic element is defined not only about the democracy component, but the amount of resources the U.S. has to exert to maintain the relationship. So that is the uh, broader configuration. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nerses. Uh, very insightful comments, of course. Uh, let's move on. Yeria, uh, any closing remarks from you, Ryan? Thank you, Robert. There were no questions, but just to add a few things. Uh, I believe that Armenia, for example, has to uh, finalize the north-south transport uh, route corridor. And unfortunately, this is the only strategic card that we have for now. If you want uh, to become a geoeconomic uh, player in the region and to have a value to become a player rather than just follow uh great powers we have to increase our geocomic uh value and also to have a leverage in the future when it comes to negotiating uh, or on the negotiation tables um and also armenia still can play a bridging role between uh india iran 
uh, the Middle East, Eurasian Economic Union, and also EU. I believe that this is also one of the values of ARMIA as a bridging role uh, between different uh, conflicting actors uh, in the region and also to avoid taking sides in a very polarized, let's say, uh, global order. This is one of my remarks. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's uh, associate over to you for uh, quick closing remarks and then we'll move on to Hago. Go ahead, Susie. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, I, I agree with a lot uh, that other fellow experts said, uh, all everything that nurses said, and I will not refer to what others said, uh, but I will switch to the question uh, of Caro because it's uh, extremely important and it's very, very complicated to answer especially very briefly, but I'll try to, to do it as, as brief as possible. So, uh, Caro is asking about uh, seceding uh, lands for peace. Uh, it's a little bit of misperception, I would say. Uh, what is happening now is extremely complicated. Uh, officially, uh, we call it delimitation and demarcation and uh, those who are opposing it are saying it's not delimitation demarcation because it's done under force and there is truth in it of course because the reason that delimitation demarcation started in Tavush which was basically the only area where Armenia was controlling Azerbaijani territories uh, not much uh, quite small area that uh, are now being handed over uh, and not in Jermuk uh, was because of the imbalance of power, because it was obvious that if this doesn't happen, Azerbaijan was going to use the argument uh, of uh, previous Azerbaijani, Soviet Azerbaijani lands still being under Armenian control, start a military offensive for that uh, with this justification and once it would start it it would take much more it would take so-called ex-soviet enclaves which we are still trying to keep uh, and negotiate exchange with uh, arts russian uh, and also uh, the maybe also more because Azerbaijanis are talking about so-called security buffer zone, reminding us about five plus two regions that Armenia was controlling uh, uh, for 30 years. Uh, what is happening is that Azerbaijan has first of all, uh, normalize the use of force and it's not just Azerbaijan, but other countries too and, uh, uh, there is no international mechanism that can prevent the use of force in the current uh, geopolitical situation. The second, because Azerbaijan is also using uh, cognitive warfare and uh, disinformation and also lawfare, uh, legitimizing its uh, justifications for each military offensive before, uh, during, and after it, as it did for Nagorno-Karabakh-Artsakh uh, contest. So in this uh, light, we could lose much more. Now we are also losing because Tavush was basically uh, the area where Ar Ar Armenia had more or less proper defense positions, and now um, some of them are lost. However, the hope is that uh, there will be international pressure on Azerbaijan, in particular by the U.S., uh, in a less extent by EU, uh, to continue delimitation and demarcation, uh, to uh, do uh, the same in Jermuk, uh, Sunik, Gerarkunik, Bayodzor, in the areas that Azerbaijan has occupied which are at least 200 and even more square kilometers. I, I'm personally quite pessimist because I'm sure that as soon as Azerbaijan gets what it wants, it will immediately uh, demand uh, ex-Soviet enclaves and Zangezur corridor in order to sabotage the rest of the del delimitation and demarcation process, which is already favorable for Armenia. However, uh, in the current situation, there didn't seem to be 
a, a, another way for risk management because uh, for sure Azerbaijan was planning an offensive and it had already normalized and uh, legitimized it, proving that those areas were um, part of uh, Soviet Azerbaijan before the first Artsakh war. This is the short answer, but this is a huge topic. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sosi. And I want to thank all the uh, uh, briefers, the panelists, of course, and all the participants. We had a great participants. It's, it's obvious, and we had some very good questions. Hopefully, they've all been addressed. If they haven't, please reach out to the uh, panelists. I'm sure they'll be happy to email back with you. And with that, I want to thank everybody again. And uh, I'll go over to you for closing remarks. Thank you very much, Ryan, and thank you to all the panelists, David, Anna, Alexander, Sosi, Yeria, Nerses, for these excellent uh, presentations and uh, insightful thoughts. And we have a panel discussion in May, on May the 25th, as Ryan mentioned. It will be on the sociopolitical thinking of Erdogan and Aliyev. And I think it, it probably will be a very interesting panel discussion again. So you're all invited to attend. And also, if you like this kind of panel discussions and what we do in Armenia as a, an organization for the ARPA Institute, please donate generously so we can do more because there's a lot to do in Armenia and Armenia needs our help. Thank you very much. And we'll see you in May, hopefully. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.